Did you know that 75% of you watching right now are not subscribed to my channel? That's bonkers. Engagement is what makes or breaks a YouTube channel, and I need your help. Subscribe today, and let's build a community together. So let's open this up and see what we got here. Cut the tape, cut the tape, cut the tape. Okay, oh, missed some. There we are. Oh, we have a letter. What's, what's the letter say? Oh, it's from Ron McAdams of Ron's Computer Videos. If you haven't checked his channel out, go ahead and do that. He's got lots of cool stuff up there. Ron writes, Joe, here's the SE30 motherboard we talked about. I've gone ahead and removed the ROM SIM so it wouldn't potentially damage the socket during shipping. So don't throw away the packaging until you find it. Okay. Uh, he says, here's a little bit of history about the board. I purchased it from a fellow Mac collector in 2017 as part of a lot of boards. He told me at the time that he tried to restore the board, but in reality, he seemingly just ended up pulling off the caps and damaging pads and traces along the way. Oh no! Uh, I was going to attempt to repair the board, but ended up finding a second, mostly working, SE30 locally, so I never revisited the project. No opponents can I'm sorry, no op I can't read. No components appear to be missing except for the caps, so it may be possible to save this board yet. The board can just drop in as a replacement for your Mac SE. The power supply and analog board is directly compatible. That's good, because I don't have Mac SE 30. All I have is an SE, so I need something to put it in, so that makes sense. One thing to keep in mind is that if your SE has an 800K model, uh, you may want to throw in a 144 megabyte drive from a newer Mac. My uh, SE actually is an 800K board with a 1.44 meg floppy drive in it. Very interesting set of circumstances there. I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, it makes sure, make sure makes loading the OS machine easier, yes. Anyway, I hope you're able to get this repaired. Good luck, sir. Ron McAdams from Ron's Computer Video. So, let's dig in and see what we got in the box here. So there's the ROM chip right there, that's cool. Let's get the box out of the way so you can see what's going on. So, we got some tape, unfold, and it's in a static bag, so that's good. I'm going to go ahead and put my wrist strap on, just in case. So, let's uh, pop this open and take a look, see what is going on. Oh yeah, there is crusty going on on this board. I see a lifted pad there, lots of flux and nasty up here. ROM chips corroded, or RAM chips corroded, those are the video RAMs. This ROM chip is a mess. Uh, oh gosh, there's corrosion all down in here, too. Wow, this has been hacked all to heck. Those uh, diodes there are a mess. The rust on the back plane of this, oh my gosh, there's, wow, it's layers of crud. Um, I'm going to switch camera angles and get you in real close and show you some of the nasty here. Okay, taking a look here, we can see, yes, the caps have been removed, the big one here is removed, all the surface mount ones are removed, and we've got, uh, we definitely have a lifted pad right there. Um, that doesn't look too bad, it looks like we can find a trace to attach that to, I'm not too worried about that. There's a lot of flux residue left on the board, uh, that's, yeah, eh. Look at the video RAM chips, they are all rusty and crusty to crap. Uh, a lot of these PAL chips are that way as well, and uh, th these were probably damaged by the electrolytic capacitors uh, in this area here. The, you know, it's pretty typical after several years they leak the, the electrolyte and it gets all over the board, and it's basically, it's an acid. It just eats everything. Uh, what else we got? More missing caps up here by the power connector. Let's double check all that rust. Look at that. It's just, it was in a moist environment or something. So we'll have to take a, a wire wheel with a, on a Dremel or something and see if we can get in there and just clean that out. And that's, that's cosmetic, I mean, but you know, if we're going to restore it, let's make it look pretty. Um, let's see here, the processor. The processor looks okay. It's got some goop on it, but no big deal. Um, the video ROM here is a corroded, absolute 
mess. It's just crusty and green all across there. Again, uh, we'll have to test to see if that works. If the, if the chip works, we can just clean up the pins in the socket and just reuse it. If not, that's a pretty standard uh, chip there. We just have to find the ROM uh, online, burn it to a new chip, and put the chip in there. No big deal. Uh, this still has the battery socket in it, and you can tell by the corrosion in this area with, around the RTC chip, uh, the diodes uh, here that are uh, that um, control whether this is run off the board power, the battery, and all that. That's all a mess. The clock chip, um, uh, the clock chip uh, what, uh, crystal here is it's got goop all over it. I don't know what's going on with that. Um, but when you look in this area right here, oh geez, all these these things are massively, massively crusty, just crusty. And I don't know if that's because this battery over here started to fail and gooped, or if there's something else going on. Because there's no root, there's no capacitors in this area, so I'm thinking that this battery just started to go yucky and it started to corrode this area. So we'll have to clean all that up as well. So yeah, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. First things first, as always, clean up the board. Uh, I'm going to take a slightly unorthodox approach to this. You can feel free to yell at me in the comments, but I don't think it's going to hurt anything. I'm going to use the old-fashioned uh, blue window cleaner to clean this board. My theory on that is this. This board has both alkaline and acid damage. If I try to neutralize with alkaline, I'm going to have a problem. If I try to neutralize with acid, I'm going to have a problem. Either way, I'm going to accelerate existing issues. So I'm going to use just plain old window cleaner, um, which is relative, it's not exactly neutral, but it's relatively neutral for what we're doing here. And then I'm going to rinse everything very thoroughly uh, before we put the board up to dry. The window cleaner also has a, a, a good chance of just breaking up any junk that might be, uh, you know, on the board. So it'll help us, it'll help us do the process. Soak that board, soak that board, soak that board, soak that board. Okay, so let's get to work. And now on the dehumidifier to dry. The board is all clean now. Is it perfect? No. Is it better? Much better. A lot of the crusty has been removed. Uh, a lot of the goop has been removed around the chips and things, uh, old flux and whatnot. And it's allowed me to get in with my magnifying glass here and take a really good close look at traces and pads and things. And it looks to me like all of the traces are intact and we only have one missing pad. Um, we do have some, still have some crusty chips here we're going to have to worry about, but uh, we will dig into those once we see what is going on with the machine and what kinds of, kind of symptoms it gives us. So the next step, uh, I guess, is to try to fix this pad here and recap the board to uh, see if we can get it into a state where it can, uh, it can boot up and run. Okay, the first thing we got to fix is the, uh, the solder pad here on capacitor number three. You can tell here it's just been lifted off, but there is still a little bit of this via hole and a little bit of the trace that was connected to that pad that's left. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to scrape back some of the solder mass to get to some good copper and then lay a tiny wire across that solder it and bring the whole length of that wire across here so that we can get an, a, a new capacitor actually soldered on and connected to that uh, to that trace. So I'm going to do that now. I'm probably going to do that off camera because it is difficult to work this zoomed up so you can see what I'm doing and actually work because I don't have a fancy uh, super duper microscope to show you what I'm doing while I'm working. I just have a, a camera on hyper zoom. So um, I'm going to do that now and uh, I'll bring you back once I have that repair completed. Okay, so we got the wire on there and I'm going to poke at it with my pokey tool here just to make sure that it's on there and it is on there pretty firm. It's not going anywhere. So that should give us a tie point to that via. Now all we have to do is recap the board. Well, we got the board. We have the awesome recap map from Mac Caps. That's a tongue twister. Uh, cutters, solder, soldering iron, and we got the parts here. So all that's left to do is to get them on the board.
So let's take a look at the work. Uh, got the capacitors all in there. There's the big ones, more little ones there. And there's a big chunk of them over there, of course. And then, you know, I've got a couple down here and they're all in there. Now my, <laughs> my surface mount uh, soldering technique is not terribly good, but they are all on and connected to the board. So I'm not gonna worry about it too much. It doesn't look pretty, but it works. Um, this is a specific area I wanted to focus on uh, here. The battery holder, uh, I wanted to replace that with a standard coin cell battery so we can keep clock on this, um, but also not have you know the old crappy uh, lithium batteries that like to explode and cause these original problems. Um, so I soldered in a coin cell uh, thing. Um, notice that this diode, which is one of the two diodes that helps switch between battery power and rail power to run the clock, uh, had failed. It was crusty. The pad was basically destroyed and gone. So I just kind of, uh, kind of hacked in a, uh, uh, hacked in just a regular diode there. Did a couple checks. Everything is fine. Continuity is correct. The diode works fine. In addition, this pad underneath this side was busted. I had to run a through hole, uh, wire patch through that and do that. Uh, this diode tested just fine. No problems there. And then while I was cleaning up the area, the uh, clock crystal uh, fell out. It fell out. It fell the heck out. So I had to resolder a new one in there. Um, so basically, yeah, we have all the caps replaced. We've got the, uh, the uh, clock circuitry fixed here. So in theory, all we have to do now is put RAM in the board, put the ROM in the board, hook it up to uh, my SE chassis, and see what happens. Okay, time for the first test. There's no ding because I don't have the speaker connected. That's normal. Let's see what comes up on the screen. Well, we have jail bars and the mouse is responding. So that means the base functionality of the machine is good, but we have something wrong with the video. Either the video is not being decoded correctly uh, because of some broken traces or there's an actual RAM problem on the board. So we have to dig into the board and start looking at traces, looking at any of the encoder chips, any of the resistor packs, any of that stuff to see if any of those could be having an effect on what's going on here. So I've done a little investigation here and I think I have the uh, faulty part figured out. So I'm gonna go through the diagnostic process with you so you can see what I did here. So the first thing uh, when trying to figure this out is we need to figure out uh, what is generating the actual video signal itself. And so if we look at the schematic here, we can see that it's UG6 is the part that actually generates the video out signal, as you can see right here. So when we look at that, uh, it's the, we look at the inputs into UG6 to make sure it's actually getting all of the video signals it needs to get. So when we look at that, that's uh, pins two through eight on UG6. So finding UG6 on here, that is this chip right here. And so if we probe those, and I'll bring up the oscilloscope here, if we probe those, we look at, that's pin two, pin three, pin four, pin five, pin six, pin seven, pin eight. So those all have signals on them, so that's good. Now where else does this chip get video data from? Well, it, it, it looks like it gets its actual input serial stream from serial vid here. Now we really don't have to uh, look at uh, that too much because we know it's getting actual data. We can see it on the screen over there. So let's follow the serial vid line back. That goes here, and it goes here, and it's this line, and we follow it, and goes and goes down, and we scroll down, and goes whoop. It comes into UE8, uh, a 74LS166. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So we we know it's getting data here. We don't have to check that. So let's check these pins, two, three, four, and five. So that is UE8, which is right here. And so let's check two, three, four, and five. That's interesting. Two doesn't look like it's getting anything. It's kind of floating. Three. Three is floating. Four. It's hard to get a contact on these. It's floating. Five is floating. 
Five looks grounded, actually. That's interesting. And then the other ones we have are 10, 11, 12, and 14. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's 10, and it has data. That's good. 11 has data. 12 has data. 13, 14 has data. So just uh, basically, if we look at the inputs coming into this chip, we can uh, and compare that to what we see on the screen, we can see that, you know, we're only getting half the data here on this chip and we're only getting half of the data on the screen. So that makes sense. It seems to me like this chip here isn't actually getting all of its inputs from where it gets its inputs from. So now let's take another look at the schematic and see where those are coming from. That's this bus line right here. So let's follow this bus line down. That's this right here. And that's this. And this. So let's check UC6. Well, let's actually take a look here. So the ones we know aren't getting data are 0, 1, 2, and 3. So let's check what is generating 0, 1, 2, and 3. That is these right here. So that's going to be UC7. So we'll check UC7, which is this chip here. And those are pins 2, 3, 22, and 23. So pin 2. These are Remember, these are rusty as heck, so it's hard to get a signal off of them. Pin 2, yeah, that's like floating. Pin 3. Pin 22. And pin 23. So, based on those findings, I have a theory. I'm pretty sure this chip here, the, um, the uh, dual port uh, video RAM, is just bad. Just a bad chip. Now, it could also be UE8. It could be uh, this uh, this chip here is actually pulling the circuit down, but I don't think so. I think it's this chip that has faulted. So, what we do next is we desolder this chip, put a new chip in here, and see if that solves our video problem. Okay, so we got the video chip replaced in there, and as you can see, I socketed the chip. That's a habit of mine when I replace chips that are solder on board that can be socketed. I tend to socket them. Um, just in case I have to pull the chip in out several times, it helps to have that socketed in the board there. So let's go ahead and zoom out. Got everything in shot along with my messy bench, and we're going to turn it on and see what happens. Aha! Jail bar patterns are gone. So now we're going to dig in a little bit further. I can tell you that during the diagnostic process, I didn't really film it because I tend to just kind of get going and playing around with stuff, that uh, there are uh, issues with the bus on this machine. Uh, this, ROM uh, this ROM chip right here sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. I have another ROM chip that doesn't ever work. Um, sometimes if I jiggle this chip, it'll, it'll work or not work. And as you can see right here, I'm, I'm booting to my SCSI to SD, but no matter what media I give this, uh, give this board, it always hangs right here. And I have a theory as to what's causing that, but we'll get into that after we uh, take a look at the next thing. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to pull this chip out. We're going to look in really close here, and I'm going to show you some interesting things I found out about this ROM chip and this ROM socket. Now looking at this, this is a ROM that came with this board, and you can tell here it's, it's kind of crunchy crusty. It's really nasty up in here too. Um, flip side of that, uh, this, uh, this chip, and the back side's not as bad, but if you look up here, it's mostly all on this side. You know, you've got corrosion-y nastiness up in here. So we'll want to clean up the ROM, but in addition, if I can get you in frame... There we go. We're going to want to clean up the ROM socket as well, because if you look across here, um, yeah, here we go. Right in here, we got some green crusties that did not get properly cleaned out. So if this socket has just some random issues, it's going to cause some of the problems we were seeing with it not posting and with the, the problem we saw early on where it won't boot to any media. So let's, uh, let's dig into this and get this all cleaned up. So we'll start with this by using the fiberglass uh, scratchy pin, scrapey pin, to uh, just go across these contacts and get those cleaned up. Just 
scrape across it with the pen. Try to get down to good metal here and get any of the corrosion and the nastiness removed. And then we use a small brush here just to get the debris off the pins and see how we're doing. This side over here looks much better, but this side here is still kind of icky. It's not perfect, but it's better. So we'll we'll start with that, and then we'll do again this side. Yep, still not perfect in this area here. And then just a little to do here. Okay, that uh, chip is cleaned up pretty well. So now let's uh, take care of the socket. So those of you who are squeamish or have any sort of preconceived notions of trying to uh, keep things clean on a machine, you might want to look away because I'm going to do something very unorthodox in cleaning this socket. And that is, I'm going to use a rotary tool, this little cheapy thing I got from the Harbor Fraud, if you want to call them that, um, with a soft brass wire brush on it so that I can really get in here and get into the edges of these things. This is either going to work or it's going to fail miserably and destroy the socket. One way or another, we're going to get a working socket in here. So, noise alert. Much better. So here we are by this messy setup. You can tell I've been hard at work. So yeah, I cleaned up that socket, but it, it did solve the weird wackiness with the socket and the ROM boot up problems where you'd have to jiggle the socket to make it work, but it didn't solve all of my issues. But you can see here that I have an operating system running. So let me tell you what I did in the background. I tested a whole bunch of different versions of operating systems, and the only one that I could get to boot was 6.0.4. And as you know, this machine can run like 7.5, so what, something weird is going on there. Um, so I just started digging into that, and I found that um, depending on the OS, it would get farther into the process before hanging. And I seemed to, it felt to me like a memory issue, like it, like it was a memory address busing problem or something wacky like that. And I was playing around and I figured it had something to do with 32-bit clean ROM, so I tried a ROM chip in here that's 32-bit clean. That didn't, that was actually worse, which made me go down that rabbit hole even more. Uh, I tried different kinds of RAM, as you can see. I moved some RAM, RAM around here and that didn't have anything to do with it. So then I used my, my, um, my logic probe here and was probing everything out. I tested every chip on this thing and there's nothing floating or anything wacky that shouldn't be floating on the board and I was just smacking my head against the wall and then I I threw it out on on um, on all my social medias zzz, all of those things and asked so guys help me figure out what this is and I somebody suggested that I remove the f the floating point chip from the board. Well this is an SE, the floating or an SE30. The floating point chip is soldered onto the board. You can't really remove it. That, but that made me think, well, is the floating point causing the problem? So here we have a working 604 um, that seems to function just fine. And I'm going to show you what happens on the oscilloscope here. So I'm going to probe the chip select line of the floating point chip. As you can see, that line is high. But the moment over here that I launch something, 
like say the chooser, the machine is now frozen. And as you can see, it's trying to select the floating point unit. So either there are just some wacky traces between the floating point unit and the rest of the machine where the FPU is bad, but I'm kind of stuck. I'm not sure how to test that short of using a hot air gun and desoldering the chip from the board to just see if it solves the problem and throwing a new chip on it that I can't find that's not really available. I'm not sure yet, but I think I'm onto something. I really do think it's this FPU. So now I got to figure out some way to confirm that's the case. So here's my solution for disabling the FPU on this board. Uh, using multiple different tiny tools and a very, very hot soldering iron, I managed to be able to lift the uh, FPU chip select uh, wire from the board without removing it, damaging it, or anything. Incredibly lucky there. I thought about trying to remove the entire chip, but I don't have the right tool to do that right now. So. Uh, I, I settled for this solution. So because that is lifted, the machine, whenever it tries to access the FPU, won't recognize that an FPU is there. So that means if the CPU uh, tries to execute an FPU instruction, it will, it will fault in a very specific way, won't detect the FPU is there, and then, you know, the, the floating point won't respond. So that means any operating system that tries to detect if the FPU is there will detect, oh, I have no FPU, and that will, self-modify in order to do any floating point operations uh, um, in the CPU the slow way instead of the nice fast way. However, because the FPU has this floating pin here, if I disconnect that, I soldered very carefully a flywire off through a 10k resistor to a 5 volt point on the board so that that won't float, this won't think that, oh, randomly, oh, it's time to do stuff on the bus, and then it, it, it's basically completely inert. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and uh, switch camera angles, get everything hooked up here, uh, and see if we can boot this up and see if it's resolved that, uh, that hanging machine problem that we had. All right, here we are set up on the bench. You can see my flywire here, and I have it just tacked to this 5-volt line down here in the corner. The ROM I have in the machine is the Big Massive Wires Rominator 2. Um, which is actually a very good test for this machine because this is the ROM that when it, before, when I was putting it in the machine, would immediately crash and not boot up at all. So this is a good test for that. In addition, it's got a built-in um, operating system that is uh, 7.1, I think. So that's greater than the 6.04, which should give us a really good test to see if this completely boots up and work, works correctly. Now, I know that 7.1 causes a hang during boot because when I try to boot from a floppy, version of it, it does it. So this is a good built-in test for all of that. So let's go ahead and turn it on and just see what happens. We got chimes. Haha, -ha, look at that. A ROM disk. Ha 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 ha! That is amazing. It seems to be booting. It's loading extensions. And we have a desktop with the FPU disabled. Well, I think that is pretty definitive that the FPU is bad, or maybe something with how the CPU is trying to talk to the FPU is bad. But that is a really good result. So that means we're about 90% done to getting this machine all finished and working. This episode is running a little bit long, so I'm going to cut it off here. But I do have both parts and tools inbound so we can get the SE30 up and running again. Stay tuned for that in an upcoming episode. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Remember to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on my latest adventures. You can also support me through Patreon or by snagging some merch at jcm-1.com. Links in the description. Well, that's all for today's episode. While you're here, check out some of my other videos. And remember, one working SE30 is all you need.